yeah, excited to be speaking with you all this afternoon. Um, I'm streaming from South Africa, so I hope the connection will hold up. Um, big thanks to the Robust Incentives Group for, for being so inviting uh, and for organizing this event. A bit about me, uh, I have an academic background in social sciences uh, and sustainability. Um, so broad interest in sort of distributed systems and collective sense making and, and generally the study of complex systems. Um, so I'm not going to be presenting uh, any specific research today. Um, instead, I'll be introducing a methodology, um, you know, hopefully one that you'll be able to incorporate into your own research and design practice. Now, I find it's always good to start with, with a promise. You know? um, and the promise is that you'll discover an applied systems thinking methodology um, you know, you, that you can add to your toolbox. And, and hopefully this will help you to design better prepared economic systems. Um, I'm aware that you know many of you will, will be familiar with dynamical systems modeling to some degree already, especially if you're, you're, in a, you're a seasoned Ethereum researcher. You know, this might not be the talk for you. Um, but you know, perhaps you've come from sort of a, a strictly engineering discipline, uh, in which case, you know, I hope this presentation will at least be helpful in establishing a, a sort of interdisciplinary orientation. So this is what we'll be doing quickly. Um, just to ground the talk. I'm going to sort of give an introduction to complexity economics. Uh, then we're going to do a crash course in systems dynamics. And by way of introducing the methodology, uh, we're going to run through the creation of a simplified EIP-1559 model. And then finally, if there's enough time, I will give you a quick introduction to the, the CAD Labs Ethereum economic model. So, you know, why situate ourselves within the field of complexity economics? <laughs> you know, the, the economy is obviously a living system, right? And and that means it's it's not always amenable to, to sort of static formulaic analysis. Um, in other words, it's messy, right? Um, so in some ways, you know, as Brian Arthur says, we really need to shed our certainties. Um, we need to embrace the nonlinear, uh, sometimes chaotic nature of these things. Um, and I think this very much applies to deeply networked systems like Ethereum. <laughs> so there's this there's this shift in in thinking from from neoclassical to complexity economics. Um, you know, the first is that you know, we need to shed the, the idea and constraint of a rational agent, um, of a homogenous sort of agent. Um, and this is where tools like agent-based modeling come in to, to, to play as well. Our models also need to account for nonlinear behavior. Um, in other words, we need to be able to include things like feedback loops, uh, delays, and, and stochastic dynamics. Um, you know, whereas, whereas neoclassical economics tends to emphasize theory uh, and elegant mathematical models, complexity economics, you know, understands, it seeks to understand evolution, adaptation, and emergence. And of course, you know, computation has, has made you know, the creation of these evolutionary economic models possible. And of course, Ethereum is a complex system, right? It's a, it's a kind of cybernetic infrastructure that's constituted by, by networks of relationships. Um, and it's also, it's a nested with a much broader economic, social, and ecological context. It also, and it was created and evolves on the basis of mental models, you know, of, of the core developers, of the validators, the users, the traders. Trade-offs, you know, as with any complex system, um, especially when we try to intervene, there, there are inevitably going to be trade-offs we have to manage. And a classic example of that is, you know, the, the blockchain scalability trilemma. There's also this question emerging about, you know, can blockchains um, sort of give rise to new kinds of institutions? And I think understanding Ethereum as such, you know, as, a, as an evolving set of technologies and practices, uh, really helps us to, to recognize the, the risks and opportunities here. So, so what tools and strategies do we have for managing complexity? And I, I, say, I say managing very much in quotes, you know, because this is a term really inherited from a Newtonian paradigm, you know, which suggests that we can, we can always intervene from above. Um, you know, as long as we understand the physical laws and of course, this approach works very well for, for designing uh, rockets and airplanes. Um, it's, it's not so suitable for, for solving problems in, in the social domain, uh, economics and social systems. Rather, we want to we try and understand underlying dynamics 
They want to understand uh, the emergence and evolution of phenomena. So I'm going to introduce a methodology that I think is particularly helpful um, for designing crypto economic systems uh, that sort of embraces this view of, of reality as, as complex and, and ultimately messy. So systems dynamics, it's, it's really an applied systems thinking. Um, and it involves dynamical models and simulations, but, but also things like con conceptual models. Just to give some you know, background context, uh, it was developed at MIT in the 50s um, by a man named Jay Forrester. And he was an engineer and he, <clears throat> he really recognized you know, that you, you, can't, you can't engineer your way out of every problem, like especially when, when it involves humans. You know? And in this sense, it's, it's fundamentally interdisciplinary. Um, it, it leverages insights from, from mathematics, computer science, psychology, game theory. So, so what is the uh, modeling component of systems analysis? Well, it's, it's really about capturing system structure. And, and this is important because, you know, in reality, dynamics emerge from the structure, right? Uh, and here, yeah, structure includes things like, um, you know, the physical structure, the stocks and material flows. Um, but, but it also includes things like information availability and, and decision logics. Um, of course, you know, most crypto economic systems, you know, decisions are being made all the time, right? Not only by machines, but, but also by human beings, and which in turn affect the, the system dynamics. Uh, that brings us to our second point, you know, which is, it's a really about capturing our mental models. I think this is really important. Um, you know, while it can help us to understand the, the evolution of a system, um, the emphasis isn't so much on predicting some future state uh, with perfect accuracy. Um, I think one of the most under underrated uh, aspects of systems dynamics modeling is, is the emphasis on a, a visual or diagrammatic approach. And you know, by explicitly representing the structure, uh, we, we, we sort of we externalize our mental model, we make it transparent and understandable. Another key advantage and is, is the sort of openness to include qualitative data. You know, traditionally, the sciences have, have wanted to ignore this dimension for various reasons. Um, but arguably, you know, that's unscientific. Um, you know, whenever the system involves uh, human beings, you know, one has to consider these dimensions. And I'll come back to this point again when we construct our, our EIP-1559 model. There are also various software packages and libraries available. Um, many of you will have come across CAD CAD already. Um, so this is the basic methodology we're gonna run through uh, in very, very broad strokes. Um, you know, the way that they're listed here is obviously too linear. Um, it's, in practice, it's, it's much more iterative. But this is the model we'll be building. Um, don't worry about not being able to see uh, the detail, we'll, we'll build it as we go. But it's basically a simplified demand fee model for Ethereum with a dynamic base fee. <clears throat> so a guiding question is here is, uh, is, you know, what is the relationship between transaction fees and demand? And how does the, the EIP uh, 1559 mechanism respond to change in demand? And th the reason I chose this uh, is because it, it captures you know, a fairly simple feedback loop in Ethereum. So the first is problem articulation. Um, you know, if you've done any uh, systems modeling before, you'll know that there's this, this tendency to sort of want to develop and expand our models uh, indefinitely. And this is important, right? We, we want to include as much detail as possible. Um, however, we can run into problems. Um, and I, I include this image to sort of illustrate what, what might happen if you don't pay attention to the model boundary uh, early on. Um, there are obviously no no hard limits to how much detail you can actually include. Um, and that's, that's really an area property of complex systems. Um, so this is trade-off between uh, detail and practicality. That's worth keeping in mind. Um, yeah, if you know your model purpose, it becomes much easier to construct, uh, communicate, and validate your model. So following this advice, um, let's articulate a purpose for the, for the model we're, we're about to create. Um, I'll start with the assumption, you know, that, that merely reading the Ethereum protocol specification is, 
is insufficient for, for fully understanding um, the, the, the dynamics of Ethereum. Um, so, so we're going to say that the purpose of this model is to demonstrate how systems dynamics uh, you know, can, can, uh, can be used to improve understanding. This is where we are in the methodology. Uh, we're going to create a, a causal loop diagram. And this is basically a conceptual tool. Uh, it's designed to reveal uh, causal relationships among a set of variables. <clears throat> uh, in other words, they, they help us to reveal uh, you know, the chain changes throughout our system. Um, and there's obviously no simulation going on. It's, uh, it's really just useful for thinking through a problem, uh, specifically for identifying these relationships and uh, feedback loops. So we've got a blank canvas. Let's, um, let's create our conceptual model of the demand fee market mechanism. Um, let's begin with, you know, with an important variable. Let's begin with uh, demand for, for block space. We know that the demand for block space affects the block size. And so we can, we can indicate this with a directional arrow and label the link as positive. Uh, and labeling this link gives us an indication about how these two variables are related. In other words, a positive sign indicates that an increase in demand uh, will result in an increase in block size, and vice versa. So a decrease in demand will result in a decrease in block size. So we can now add a third variable, base fee. For the purposes of this model, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna ignore. Uh, tips um, when you start focus on base view. Note the double parallel lines. This indicates that there is a delay. Uh, in this case, it's, it's a very small delay. It's like in between blocks. Um, but they're really worth paying attention to in general because you know, typically if you observe oscillations in your system, for example, uh, you're most likely dealing with uh, a, a material information delay of some kind. Next, we're, we're, uh, we'll add a variable which captures the effect of base fee on demand. And you might ask, you know, like why, why create a separate variable here? Why not add a link directly from base fee to demand? Um, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the, the core practices of, of systems dynamics is to openly include qualitative data. And we wanna be very, very explicit when we do this, right? And the effect of fees on demand is, is a good example of, of a more qualitative variable. You know, how economic participants respond to fluctuating fees uh, depends on their perspective. Um, in other words, you know, how much do they value making a transaction on Ethereum? Um, this is ultimately a qualitative uh, sort of decision. Um, and of course, we can use historical data uh, to, to inform our representation of this uh, relationship in mathematical terms. So we can still be rigorous when including these, these kinds of data. And finally, we can close off and label our loop. Now we've captured, captured a, an important feedback loop uh, in Ethereum, this, this demand fee relationship using a conceptual diagram. And by, by labeling you know, all the link polarities, we're, we're able to quickly identify the nature of this feedback loop. Uh, in other words, you know, we can identify whether we are dealing with a, 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 a reinforcing or balancing loop. Balancing loops, they, they, they exhibit goal-seeking behavior. Uh, in other words, they seek, seek uh, stability. And what we'll find here is, you know, just by labeling the feedback loop, we, we immediately get a sense about how a change will manifest. In this case, it will, it will counteract itself. And we can add extra detail um, to indicate sort of demand originating from outside this loop and more detail about how block size is determined. Step size for the IP mod by nine. So let's convert our causal loop diagram into a stock flow diagram. Um, in addition to adding more detail, it, it really it sets us up nicely, I think, to, to convert our conceptual model into a dynamical simulation. This is a stock. Um, it represents an accumulated quantities uh, of some measurable thing or resource. Um, in other words, you can think of them as, as the memory of the system. This is an inflow. Um, it's defined mathematically as, as a rate of change of, of some quantity. And this is an outflow. Um, and so the stock will accumulate or deaccumulate uh, as a result of the difference between these, these inflows and outflows. In other words, this system is sort of described mathematically as a set of differential equations. So let's apply this to our causal loop diagram from earlier. 
we'll replace demand for blocks uh, block space with, with the stock flow diagram. And of course, we can also replace our base fee variable uh, with a, a simple stock flow model. And we can add more detail. Again, we, we make it easier for us to model uh, and simulate, and, and we also make our assumptions very transparent. So, you know, on their own, these conceptual modeling tools are obviously, you know, they can be quite powerful. Um, but in many cases, we'll want to construct a dynamical uh, model. We want to we'll want to observe the, the the behavior over time, and they they allow us to do some pretty cool things. Um, they allow us to observe nonlinear behavior uh, over potentially very long time frames. Um, we can get all sorts of predict unpredictable results, uh, particularly when your model contains feedback loops and, and endogenous decision logics and stochastic dynamics. They also allow us to run uh, multiple experiments and scenarios. Um, you know, just by tweaking initial conditions and parameters, we can find out how our system evolves over time. We can also do things like perform sensitivity analysis, and you know, identify key leverage points, uh, things like this. And all of these support uh, us in designing sort of better intervention strategies. So here's our conceptual model converted into a dynamic model. You know, I've added some charts showing the base fee and the block size over, over 60 minutes. And of course, you know, to create the dynamical model, you know, we're going to have to define each of these relationships in mathematical terms. Um, fortunately, with, you know, with Ethereum and, and well-documented protocols, you don't have to do much, much, much guesswork here when it comes to the, the mathematical specification. And of course, we'll want to, <clears throat> we'll want to validate our model against historical data. Uh, and that's that's another advantage of working with blockchains. Once you're satisfied, you know that your model is is behaving as expected. You know, we can then run all kinds of experiments based on you know what your problem articulation was. And this is where it gets really fun, right? You know, where are the sensitivities? Where are the leverage points? Um, how does our system behave under different initial conditions? Um, and we can use parameter sweeps, Monte Carlo runs, sensitivity analysis to generate insights. So that was the crash course. Um, very broad strokes. I've obviously let out, uh, left out a lot of nuance, um, but I hope it at least gets you excited about constructing your own conceptual and dynamical models. Um, just to end off, um, I wanted to give a quick introduction to the open source Ethereum economic model. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can find the full project on GitHub. Uh, and there's a cool front end interface at ethmodel.io. You know, the project was <clears throat> it was spearheaded by CAD Labs, I believe, with support from a uh, robust incentives group. It's a, it's a Python model. It uses the RadCAD library, which is an extension of CAD-CAD. And it's a dynamical model, right? It's, it's, it can be used to study ETH supply dynamics uh, in the transition to proof of stake. Um, you know, questions with important implications, like uh, at what point and under what conditions will, will ETH become deflationary? It can also be used to study the effect of uh, validator yields uh, on, under various adoption and price scenarios. So the initial scope, you know, it's very much about studying validator economics. And I think the, I think the project is worth mentioning for, for a few reasons. The first is that it, you know, it's a great example of open box modeling. Um, it's open source, the assumptions are transparent. Um, the guys have just done an excellent job in terms of model architecture and documentation. The second point is that it's a it's a versatile research model. As I said, you know, it was originally scoped around validated economics, but you know, if you've got a guiding research question in mind, um, you could you could extend it to run various experiments. And of course, these extensions would be would be uh, contributions to the Ethereum community. The third point um, is that. You know, systems dynamics models like this really are low cost learning laboratories. And this relates, you know, very closely to the idea of a digital twin. You know, particularly when we, when we consider the effect of evolving these systems on real participants, uh, you know, we want to make sure we've done enough testing. Um, and, and that's the real value of, of a digital twin. You know, we're talking about an open source development context here, you know, with opportunities to connect the model to, to more like APIs, uh, potentially use machine learning, uh, add agent level interactions, 
and, and generally involve it into uh, an extensive and robust research model. So, yeah, with enough supports uh, and extensions, uh, it could it could in practice become like a you know a de facto Ethereum digital twin, and that, that would be really exciting to see. Yeah, that concludes. Um, it's been fun. Um, thanks for organizing this event. Uh, I'm not sure how we're on time. Um, if the audience has any questions. Uh, if not, it's been great to talk to you. And, uh, Thank you, Ross. If there are any questions, um, yes. Hello. Um, thank you for um, your speech. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, what do you see as the impact of understanding and not understanding systems dynamics when creating with blockchain? Yeah, good question. Um, feedback, yeah. Yeah, uh, reality is is as I say, messy and complex. And if we if we sort of don't have the right conceptual understanding and and tools for for um, you know, we don't want to complex. We don't want to uh, sort of um, reduce reality into you know simplified models and things. And so it's I guess that that phrase you know. Every model is wrong, but some are more accurate. It's sort of apt here. Um, I think it applies to Ethereum as well and, and blockchains in general. They are, they are in many ways just simple systems, but because they interface with a larger economic, social, and ecological context, um, we also have to have this broader systems view of you know, how they evolve and how they interact uh, with the rest of uh, reality and society. So tools like system dynamic, uh, I think. Um, Consequentially, yeah. We have one question over here. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. That was really cool. Uh, is, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, I was just saying uh, thanks for the presentation. That was really cool. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you primarily take a simulation simulation based approach, or do you also look at doing inference, for example, fitting the parameters in these differential equations? Yeah, um, in some cases, you know, conceptual models will be enough. Um, as I say, dynamical models, you know, help you um, to, to, to observe behavior over long time frames and sort of um, observe these nonlinear behaviors. You'll want to do things like parameter speech to find, you know, especially to validate your model against sort of the reality, uh, so to speak. Um, yeah, there are sort of various methods for, for, for making sure your, your model is sort of validated. Um, and as I say, you know, the advantage of blockchains is we have so much data in which to to to, to validate uh, our models against. One more. I'm not sure I understood your question. I'm um, just I wondering, with the uh, agent-based modeling side of things, um, what yeah. kind of agents have have you designed or, or tested um, in your simulations? Uh, yeah, I have not too much experience with agent-based modeling. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the difference really is that systems dynamics is looking at aggregate uh, level dynamics. So, you know, a population, for instance, will be modeled as a single stock um, and you won't differentiate between, um, you know, subpopulations or, or specific agents, uh, behaviors and perspectives. And that, that's the advantage of agent-based modeling. Um, Um, yeah, as I said, I haven't done but, uh, much agent-based modeling, but uh, yeah, it gets really interesting when you start combining these two approaches. Um, you can get the advantage of system-level picture while also sort of being fed uh, the results of the agent interactions, um, and that can help us to make, uh, I think, you know, much more sort of uh, realistic uh, and interesting models. Thank you, Ross. Um, thanks for joining from South Africa and uh, have a great day over there. <laughs> Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks.